All right, so welcome to UMD Cast episode eight. Today we will be interviewing Dr. Kessel, a senior public health advisor, program director, and professor. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. We'd like to start off by asking you to tell us a little bit about your path from being a college student to being the distinguished healthcare professional you are today. Sam, thank you. And, and uh, thank you, Jason and Sabir, for uh, inviting me to you know, chat uh, uh, with you a little bit. Uh, and for this wonderful project that you're doing of, you know, interviewing people around the country and trying to get some insights. So I appreciate, uh, again, being here and hi out there to all of the uh, University of Maryland folks who are pursuing some kind of uh, uh, pre-med track. Um, I guess, you know, very quickly, um, um, I went to Drexel University as an undergrad uh, and pursued uh, electrical engineering. Uh, I graduated uh, with a degree in electrical engineering and um, uh, Drexel had a unique program then called the co-op program. Now in some places it's called internships. We've got new creative uh, terminology for all of it, but it afforded me an opportunity to explore a little. I worked for, for example, um, um, the Philadelphia Power mm -hmm. Company, generating electricity. I can tell you stories about brownouts and blackouts and those kinds of things and what I was involved with, but it also gave me an opportunity to spend uh, uh, time working in a bioengineering lab um, and working on some projects and getting a different um, experience and perspective. And because of that perspective, um, I went on to medical school um, and I went to um, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the South Bronx. And, um, you know, each experience has had some formative, um, unique consequence. Being um, in New York, particularly the South Bronx, has had some um, consequence on my career trajectory. And um, after medical school, I went to Boston and I um, spent my residency in pediatrics uh, uh, in another urban inner city um, uh, municipal hospital, Boston City Hospital in, uh, uh, in Boston. And again, you, you see aspects of medicine and social circumstances that... Uh, you know, played a unique role. And in fact, um, as I was finishing my residency, one of the questions was, well, what am I going to do now? Um, you know, nobody in my family had been a private practitioner and medical school prepares you for certain tracks and not every track. But, you know, I said to myself, um, um, I was going to do adolescent medicine. That was where I'd spent a lot of time medical school and even in residency. But I said, let's do a fellowship to see what the bigger context is. Um, um, you know, the metaphor is typically uh, in medical school and in residency, fundamentally, you're well educated in rescue, uh, you know, jumping in the water and saving lives. Um, you may in some programs go a little upstream and you know, look at some antecedents to you know, health conditions. Um, certainly COVID-19 uh, has uh, helped us appreciate uh, you know, not only a new pathogen and its consequence, but frankly, underlying conditions that have been uh, ignored that cause some of the untoward consequences. And even if you, I, I said, I want to go all the way upstream and frankly uh, see, you know, pediatrics is about prevention. And I really wanted to um, um, move from treatment, which is critical and essential, but to see if you couldn't prevent some of these kinds of things. And there was a wonderful opportunity, a Robert Wood Johnson Fellowship to come to Washington, D.C., and um, I was really fortunate enough to um, um, work with then Surgeon General and Assistant Secretary for Health, Julie Richmond, and um, 
um, Secretary Califano in the Department of Health and Human Services. And um, somehow or other, I stayed in there for, I stayed there for um, three plus decades working on child health policy. Um, and when, you know, I completed my tenure there, um, um, joined the faculty at Dartmouth with Dr. Coop, uh, Surgeon General Coop, um, and the Department of Pediatrics, and then University of Maryland in the, you know, in the School of Public Health and, you know, with several colleagues who had been in the United States Public Health Service with me. Probably a long answer to a short question. No, thank you. We appreciate that answer. Um, so what was it like making that transition from uh, maybe wanting to practice medicine to switching more into public health? Was it like you could apply a lot that you already learned or was there still a learning curve in getting used to it? Well, you know, I, I, I will tell you the grounding in engineering was really very formative. I mean, the notion of, of you know, learning the basic sciences, whether it's physics, chemistry, but engineering is about applying basic science to problem solve. Um, and sometimes at the individual level and sometimes at um, the population level. And because of my experiences in the South Bronx with poverty and, and something called the social determinants of health, meaning where you live, where you work, where you play has some uh, profound consequence. Um, um, you know, on access, on health, on well-being, on a whole litany of um, uh, circumstance. So I was somewhat um, um, sensitized, if you will, or experienced with um, you know, a formative story is uh, when I was a medical student um, taking care of a child um, shot um, by their cousin. They were playing with a, a weapon on the streets of the South Bronx and not appreciating that um, these were lethal events so that experiencing gun violence um, um, related directly to children, unintended injury, um, in addition to the violence surrounding uh, events on the streets of the South Bronx and um, frankly in Boston um, as well. So the notion of going from treating one patient to moving up scale uh, to prevention is really part of pediatrics. I mean, where children live, work, play, the schools that they go to, the families they live in, the communities that they're in affect the, you know, their well-being. I mean, you can't prescribe a medication that requires cold storage and families not have a refrigerator at home. So you started to see things outside, if you will, of the direct patient care. And, and I think pediatrics fundamentally uh, brings in the community, brings in certainly the family, and then the family brings in uh, the community. So the notion um, for me wasn't um, going from individual cases. It was really sort of um, balancing those individual cases and trying to prevent it. And, and I guess I would call myself more of a macro pediatrician. Um, um, hopefully accomplished in individual patient care, but, you know, but appreciating that there are events uh, influencing uh, individual patient care. And I had an obligation and responsibility to do both. So, you know, interesting enough, grounded in engineering, the application of science and problem solving and um, the context in which um, I learned uh, what, what today is called uh, uh, personalized medicine um, and moving it into public health or population-based medicine, um, um, there was virtually no transition. And I would keep moving betwixt and between seeing individual patients and trying to figure out some of the bigger solutions for some of these incredible problems we are challenged with.
So do you, do you mind giving like an example? You mentioned how you're more um, focused on the prevention of disease or disorders in, pedi in, a pedi uh, in children. Um, can you give an example of maybe a policy that you've implemented to try and do that? Sure. Um, you know, a direct example is, um, you know, and again, uh, you know, I think, I think COVID has only exacerbated a number of these things. Um, in order to be seen by, by, you know, a qualified health professional, um, um, you need access. You know, and access involves a number of things, but not the least of which is the ability to afford it. Um, health insurance. And um, uh, I was involved in a wonderful project um, in Western Pennsylvania. Um, um, and to some degree it succeeded, I, I will admit up front because of celebrity. Celebrity being um, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, celebrity being Mr. Rogers, uh, celebrity being, uh, frankly, some enlightened folks at Blue, Claw Blue Cross and Blue Shield. The short version is the project in Western Pennsylvania, we were very conscious of the steel workers were laid off in a, and, uh, because of changing economic circumstances. And a, a, an interesting tenant of health insurance is risk pooling. In other words, when you're uh, employed, the assumption is you're in a bigger pool and you're by and large healthy because you're employed. So after your, the plant closes, your personal status didn't change. You may have some challenges paying for things, but you weren't at any greater risk, um, you know, 24 hours later. And um, we created a project largely supporting children in Western Pennsylvania with the help again of uh, Mr. Rogers, Fred, um, the Pittsburgh Sealers, um, 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 Blue Cross and Blue Shield, who ultimately uh, were willing to offer family plans to these laid off steel workers. Um, we tried to take this to scale and in Pennsylvania, we ended up creating something called um, 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 a program supporting um, insurance for children and families, and it was supported by a cigarette tax. Unfortunately, I used to walk around calling it smoke for kids. The more you, you know, and these are quote sin taxes. So the more you smoked, uh, the more money there was in the pool. And we had we were very successful in the state legislature, and it enhanced uh, uh, reduced uninsured number of children in Pennsylvania almost uh, dramatically. As a consequence of that, you know, I wrote this up as, a, as an example of, a, a, of an effective program. And fortunately, um, President Clinton, um, um, Mrs. Clinton, Hillary Clinton, you know, and others, it got traction and it became the law of the land uh, federally in 19, um, uh, if I remember correctly, 97. And we now have the lowest uninsured number of children in the United States because of the Children's Health Insurance Program that is virtually in every state. Um, and it provides that access, you know, a public approach to providing access to individual um, uh, care. A lot of people along the way. I mean, all of these things are team efforts, but you know, it was really uh, you know Senator Kennedy and Senator Hatch. It was bipartisan, and um, it was uh, one of the complexities here is that President Bush actually vetoed the renewal of this program twice, and um, I testified. Um, uh, with Senator Kennedy, and I also went to the White House and tried to help um, appreciate how could you veto something for children? I mean, not just, you know, you have to figure out what the appropriate path is to effective policy. You know, sometimes it's an appeal to the heart. 
you know, um, sometimes, it, you know, it's always evidence-based. Um, but that to me is one of the more significant ones and the appeal of the, the um, um, was overturned twice and it's still there and it's still allowing, um, you know, these are for kids who are not eligible for Medicaid. Um, these were kids who were above that with families where I explained to the, to the White House, the president, you know, some of these families making what looks like enough money is because they're working four jobs um, and none of them offer health insurance. So even though, you know, on their income tax, you know, your earned income looks, you know, um, fairly substantial, it's because, you know, a lot of those families were working uh, multiple jobs and without the benefit of literally benefits. Wow, it sounds like an amazing program. Like you did a great job. Um, well, I was lucky, yeah. you know, good collaborators. And, you know, the miracle is that it's still working and it's really dramatically reduced the number of uh, the financial burden for families. Um, and it was a great collaboration. It sounded like a real team effort and um, it's really cool. Yeah, it is. Um, and kind of on the same topic of prevention, um, first of all, that's incredible um, what you guys did. But I was wondering if there was something that you or like you with a team have actively done to prevent, like, and I know that in effect, like the health insurance does this as well, but I was wondering if maybe even more specifically, like prevention of diseases and promotion of like physical, mental, and social well being for children. Um, and then also, if you could describe your day to day, just because you seem like um, you have a lot going on, which is amazing. But I was wondering how you juggle everything together and what well, you're doing. You know, all of exciting. these are, you know, sort of good questions. And, you know, and to your audience, you know, gaining these experience along the path, I think, you know, helps you, you know, appreciate um, the challenges that, that, you know, sort of exist, frankly, you know, today, whether it's the disparities in vaccines, availability of vaccines. I mean, ironically, um, there's no cost issue currently related to vaccines. And yet there are significant uh, communities that, that uh, are not vaccinated um, more by lack of access than actually by, by choice. But, but you know, one of your questions, uh, Sabir, builds on that experience and, and primary prevention, unintentional injury. Um, we've got a long history in this country, particularly, for example, um, um, with seatbelts. With, with, you know, when I was growing up, you could sit anywhere in a damn car. You know, you, you weren't restrained and you know, the, the, the most important part was getting close to the window, rolling the window down and, you know, letting the fresh air blow on you and watching, you know, the, the events as, you know, mom and dad, you know, took us someplace. Um, and, you know, a primary motivation in, in those days might have been, um, you know, more luxury, more convenience, you know, um, you wanted an air conditioned car, you ended up being lazy on electric windows, you know, and, and frankly, uh, the first safety seats were developed um, um, largely to keep the kids from squirming around and also just to elevate them to be able to see out the window, them meaning us, we were all kids. But now one of the dominant features of car sales is safety. Uh, I mean, it's sort of fascinating how it's gone from sort of luxury to does it stop by itself? You know, do you have three dimensional cameras? You know, does it steer and auto correct um, um, airbags and particularly safety seats and and seat belts? Um, so this is sort of an example of you know, how forces came together, Sapir, the marketing and the promotion, you know, car sales dominate now and you see lead commercials, whether it's Mercedes or Bavo or Subaru, you know, 
at least my recollection this morning is, you know, you watch this Subaru stop by itself and, and a child continues to walk across, you know, the intersection. So the same notion for me is about how did public health uh, participate? And, and I wanna be, you know, direct with you. It didn't outlaw vehicles. You know, it didn't outlaw um, guns is where I'm going with this. It made one, the product safer. It made driving better. You know, we all, if you've got a license, you have to have experience, you know, it's a whole, they don't just give you the keys and sort of off you go. Um, and the same thing with, um, with uh, gun violence prevention. For me, you know, a number one priority is that, you know, uh, look, uh, no, no child should die from an automobile collision. And by the way, we don't call them accidents because accidents implied we couldn't do anything about them. And we obviously changed the roads, we changed the cars, we, cha we added seat belts, we made driving education you know, more dominant. So we were aggressively involved. And similarly, we're trying to work on um, gun violence prevention. And, and, you know, whether it's homicide, suicide, um, or unintentional injury, a common denominator is something called safe storage. You know, keeping, um, you know, a lethal means, um, you know, out of the hands of of certainly children who think in many respects they're toys um, um, and safe storage doesn't mean you can't be a sportsman, you can't own the weapons, you can't, you know, whatever. I mean, there's other dimensions that we can go into, but that's an example for me of applying, you know, a public health approach, you know, and we did this to some degree with cigarette smoking too, um, you know, and we had some help. I mean, every Surgeon General that I worked for um, was really the spokesperson against, um, you know, cigarette smoking. Um, cigarette smoking a little different than, you know, car safety and automobiles in that there's no redeeming features of cigarette smoking. You know, we, you could argue calms you down. Tragically, we used to put them in, in, um, uh, the PAX survival kits with soldiers, because in World War II, and you know, folks got addicted as a consequence of some of those kinds of things. But um, and smoking is still the number one preventable cause of um, morbidity and mortality. I mean, it's amazing with all the efforts that we've had, and you know, with incredible spokespersons as surgeons general. But you know, for me at the moment. Um, just storing weapons safely, making impulsive behaviors around death by suicide, creating a pause, creating some effort that it says these are stored safely. The ammunition, ammunition may be separate, the weapons are secured. And even with, you know, frankly, homicide, um, um, you know, the case of, of those children in Florida that escaped from, you know, one facility and ended up in another home broke in and there were weapons all over the place. I'm not criticizing the, the homeowner, but had those weapons been locked up, that child wouldn't have been shot by the police. So there's multiple dimensions of taking what we're learning, you know, and, 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 and many others about just promoting the well-being of children, promoting growth, development, promoting play as a creative developmental um, improvement, um, having relationships, having um, primary care is, is sort of, um, you know, another element because they're all related to community and, you know, and relationships. All of my answers are long, so you're not going to get to all of your questions. <laughs> no, thank you for the answers. It's great to hear about everything in depth. 
Um, but going all, along the lines of primary prevention, you've been talking primarily about like uh, things that like people could do, like take a gun or go smoke a cigarette. But what about things that involve more like lifestyle changes, like uh, the obesity epidemic in the country and things like um, uh, mental health in our country, where it's more of like a lifestyle change and like maybe even just for like society as a whole, how is that stuff dealt with? Is it just education and that's really all we could do? Or is there anything that could be implemented at some point? Well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start a little with overweight and obesity. I mean, first and foremost, recognizing um, overweight and obesity as a, as a concern and an issue, and particularly, in, you know, in children. If I were really in my professorial role, I would flash, you know, uh, uh, a trend data uh, uh, chart, but somewhere in the late 70s the, is where the, you know, the trends have gone up. And, and I don't want to suggest causal relationships, but we started not to eat at home. We started to eat out. Um, we started to um, um, focus on uh, being a chef as a profession, as a growth. Fast food started to um, continue. We started to, you know, it's not just fast food in the restaurant, it's, it's fast food at home, um, which oftentimes has um, nutritional elements in it that, uh, um, that if you could choose you know, the fruits and vegetables and prepare them yourself. So it's a confluence of a number of things. But I was fortunate enough uh, and still work with them um, to work with Sesame Street, um, with Sesame Street Workshop. And we were involved in trying to get, um, in a, in a, in a, in, and by no means, we were just sort of helping. They were really there, increasing physical activity um, and making healthy choices. So in one meeting, um, we were in New York and Sesame Workshop is just an absolutely delightful place to go in. There's Elmo and Big Bird and, and Grover and Cookie, or, they're all over the place. So it's just a very, talk about a um, fun place to go into work. I don't know if the employees think that, but I certainly love going. And, and we were in a meeting trying to, you know, think out loud how we could work on this. And I raised my hand and I said, does anybody in the room know what five inch uh, linotype is? I'm not going to ask you, but um, it used to be when we printed newspaper, you know, back in the days of Benjamin Franklin, they actually had um, 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 block printing, printing, they were made out of metal, and they used five inch linotype only for certain events, war declared, war over. So I raised my hand and I said, we could get the New York Times to dust off their five inch linotype. Why? I said, cookie monster gives up cookies. And, you know, um, we had a long conversation about that. Now the workshop, smarter than I, but took that notion and created the idea that cook cookies are sometimes food um, and healthier foods are an anytime food. So a smarter variant, not of prohibiting something, you know, but again, it was, you know, public-private collaboration. It was focusing on child development and, and clearly, you know, um, I mentioned celebrities before, you know, to say Elmo, um, you know, virtually every generation um, knows who Elmo is and, and moving, you know, and moving that, that um, those issues forward. An element, you know, quickly to move into helping children um, you know, and we've got mental, we've got many terms, you know, we used to call it mental illness. Now we call it mental health and by and large still 
meet, really mean mental illness. And some of us have been pushing the idea of brain health, trying to look at the neurons and the anatomy and the biology and um, linking, you know, um, um, some of the incredible uh, work we've done in all of this. But uh, many, many years ago, there was a study done, something called adverse childhood experiences. And we now call them ACEs. And, you know, an ACE might, and they were originally mostly focused on child abuse and neglect. But now we've come to experience that during the course of growing up, you experience positive um, and not such positive things. And some of them could even be you know, trauma that you experienced indirectly, violence on TV, violence in the news in your community. Um, and we've been working on projects trying to look at what does it mean? And, and to oversimplify, um, there's a new project out by Nadine Burke Harris, who's a pediatrician, good friend in, in California, Surgeon General of California, called Know Your Number. So in a linear fashion, if you've had one or two or three adverse experiences, not highly at risk. But again, with the notion of prevention and applying science, if, you, if you've had more than three, four experiences, we need to be more conscientious about your own mental health, the long-term consequences uh, of all this. Um, you know, uh, you know, another friend, um, um, it's almost an engineering term, allostatic load. You know, what the heck is an allostatic load? That sounds like, you know, physics. But it's really the experience of ACEs, direct experience of poverty, of, of struggles that have accumulated that put kids at risk. So some of the prevention is really dealing with what I like to call our root causes. I mean, we're, we're, we're really trying not to put Band-Aids on things, although frankly, Band-Aids have their place, right? You know, particularly the ones with Elmo or Big Bird on them, they, you know, uh, make the make the boo-boo better. But, you know, so those are experiences with, and we still have, you know, indeed overweight and obesity, we haven't talked much about it, but we certainly learned with COVID that overweight and obesity is a comorbid condition that in some cases led to poor outcomes. You know, we're trying to refine exactly what do we mean by, you know, overweight and obesity and how overweight and how obese and trying to get a better handle on all of that. And certainly, you know, the um, being isolated for all these months and months and months, um, you know, young children and families and, um, um, and certainly, you know, particularly young people, um, you know, feeling isolated and stressed and, you know, trying to deal with, um, you know, preventive mental health issues, uh, community connectedness, respect, you know, and then there's overlays of all the things that you guys, you know, see every day in the news. I mean, racism and, and anti you know, this group or that group and, and anti based on religion or skin color or um, where you grow up. I mean, we're in, in challenging times and communities here. Thank you for that great answer. And just kind of as a follow up, like you're talking about um, prevention still, but with a lot of these issues like obesity and stuff, it's kind of just in the culture now. Has there ever been more of an effort to like adaption because now it's like fast food and just unhealthy eating so widespread and like with mental health, there's so much stuff out on the internet for kids to see. It's kind of like once a cucumber becomes a pickle, it can't really go back to being a cucumber. So is there any way that we could like adjust to being the pickle now? You know, Sam, I think, I think pickles probably have the same nutritional value as a, as a cucumber. Uh, um, and frankly, you know, it relates to obesity. If you happen to like pickled cucumbers, better known as pickles, that's, there's good health reasons to, you know, um, enjoy a pickle as opposed to a, 
as opposed to a cucumber. But you raise an interesting question. And it 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 takes a huge community that, you know, first you look at the science, you look at the evidence. You know, in overweight and obesity, what is it? You know, is it calories? Is it, you know, food, you know, caloric density? Is it the lack of nutrients? Is it you know, the lack of, you know, availability. I mean, yeah, we've done studies, young children walking to school uh, experience, you know, more fast food places, um, you know, and um, um, high sugared beverages are easier to obtain than, uh, you know, less. But, you know, we worked with McDonald's. I will tell you probably one of the more interesting experiences was going to meet with corporate McDonald's. And again, you know, Sam, when you're in class, I'm gonna ask these questions, you're gonna have an advantage. Um, you know, what does McDonald's sell? And, you know, the typical answer is a hamburger, right? Big Mac, something. Now there's the chicken sandwich wars, right? The fried chicken sandwich wars. But they sell consistent consistency which is sort of fascinating, you know, so if you're from a marketing point of view, you know, how does every McDonald's or any McDonald's that you go into, how does it all taste the same? I, it's amazing, you know, whether it's in Texas or Manhattan, you know, or in New Jersey, you know, it's sort of amazing. Um, so consistency, cleanliness, hmm, I said to them, I'm not sure in all the places I went to it was cleanliness and convenience. And because they didn't start off saying we sell, you know, high fat, uh, calorically dense food, et cetera, et cetera, we then negotiated changes in the yeah, in the Happy Meal uh, to give parents some choices, to offer some choices, um, and they were willing to do it. Their goal, um, you know, was to sell Happy Meals, and if putting, you know. Um, uh, sliced cucumbers, Sam, back to your notion, sliced cucumbers, you know, in there and carrots and, you know, celery sticks, um, you know, instead of French fries, you know, they were willing to do it. It wasn't the corporate reluctance. And that was really an enlightening experience, you know, for me that, that, you know, it's a little like the automobile industry went from luxury to marketing safety, you know, um, you know, in that experience. So that there's opportunities um, if, you know, um, one of the tenets, uh, the principles of public health is understanding what the problem is and understanding the detail and the data and you know what's happening um and then to try some you know uh solutions what's what's the action that followed based upon the data and one of the responsible things both you know in public health and in medicine is follow up and follow through what happened you just don't put it out there and keep your fingers crossed you you, you sort of look at these things and then you just it's an ongoing um, sort of improvement. So creating these collaborative partnerships with communities, with, you know, um, with industry, um, you know, I've worked with uh, breakfast in the classroom, breakfast uh, programs um, sponsored by um, Health and Human Services and Agriculture, trying to get um, um, healthier foods um, in the classroom, first and foremost, nutrition for kids who don't have the opportunity in some communities, you know, so school becomes not only uh, nutrition for the brain, but nutrition for the body. Um, and I'll tell you one quick story, and then you can go on to other questions. But I happen to be on the National WIC Advisory, WIC Women, Infants and Children. And WIC different from SNAP, food stamp, supplemental nutrition programs, because you had to have a medical reason. 
uh, I mean, the, the origins of the WIC program were that, you know, instead of me writing a prescription for iron, because you had iron deficiency anemia, I could write a prescription for Popeye's spinach. So you could eat the food that provided the spinach. So it was a creative um, effort. And that one and, and the last one I'm gonna tell you for, for the longest time, the WIC program, ironically, even with a lot of you know, enlightened folks, didn't support breastfeeding. Um, you know, they were supporting a commercially prepared infant formula. So in one meeting, I sat there in the back of a napkin and I made some very conservative assumptions uh, about um, breastfeeding, the benefits not in dispute, but that feeding mom, um, to enable mom to have the calories, the nutrition, uh, the nutrients to breastfeed uh, made more money for the farmers than commercially prepared infant formula. So because I introduced this fascinating component and created sort of a win-win in this public policy arena, we walked out of that meeting, we had a dramatic policy change simply because you could make the argument that, you know, the, the economics were in fact better but the health outcome was even better because we, we could get farmers to support breastfeeding because they were you know, providing healthy foods to mom instead of commercially prepared um, infant formula. Not, not being critical of commercially prepared infant formula, but trying to get that kind of thoughtful balance in all of these things. Wow. Um, I just want to confirm our... Are, are you the reason Cookie Monster turned into Veggie Monster from Sesame Street? Yeah, I was moving in that direction. But again, <laughs> they were smarter than I when they, when they you know, uh, more thoughtfully said cook, cookies are a sometimes food, which mm -hmm. indeed they are, versus, you know, other things are an anytime food. You know, like, you know, look, vegetables frankly are an anytime food you may not want to you know i again i prefer pickles to cucumbers but you know now i'm stuck sam on that on that uh metaphor that that model but but i i think it was you know cookie monster appreciating in a developmental sense you know the broader educational content and and sesame street is predicated frankly, on, you know, making learning fun and not only making learning fun, you know, we could probably all sing something about brought to, brought to us by the counter by, you know, I used, you know, I picked on Cookie Monster because I fundamentally, the meeting started with what do all the characters eat? I have a vague idea what Big Bird might eat, but I don't quite know what the diet of, all, of everybody else was. But I, I don't want to take full responsibility for eliminating cookies, but I think Cookie Monster, you know, got, got appreciated, you know, sometimes versus anytime. Um, so I guess kind of on the same note of like nutrition and obesity, um, recently in the media, um, I guess there are many people like everywhere on the internet who it's become more of a trend to applaud um, obesity and accepting different body types and pretty much like um, in some cases applauding like an unhealthy lifestyle in a sense because um, they're promoting body positivity which is great in a sense but at the same time like it could also be very unhealthy so I was just wondering what your take was on that. Well you ask a very you know thoughtful question. Um, one of the you know, to our colleagues out in Zoom space, you know, maybe not today, but when they ever view these, you know, thoughtful interviews you've created. Um, one of the principles in medicine is homeostasis. You know, and again, I, you know, I'm not gonna pick on the three of you, but normally I would 
ask. I mean, fundamentally, in very simple terms, it's balance. You know, the body works hard to sort of keep things in balance, you know, keep electrolyte balance, keep fluids, keep caloric, you know, I mean, we work hard at balance. So the notion here is trying to keep things in balance. Bullying and shaming are not things we want to promote. And typically, you know, these are, these are part of the ism list. Um, and bullying and shaming um, are just, frankly, you know, unacceptable events. And I think that was part of the motivation behind accepting people for who they are, you know, and how they look, you know, you know, would you help somebody not smoke? Well, I had a boss who in certain meetings would take the damn cigarette out of somebody's mouth, a little direct, you know, uh, but in other circumstances. And again, I, I guess one of the issues, you know, is you have to decide how and when to best um, intervene. Um, um, you know, do we use punishment as a mechanism for promoting something that's good? That seems antithetical. I mean, I go back to my, you know, smoke for kids, you know, how, how did we, I still am a little embarrassed that we picked the syntax to promote the financial base for improving health insurance for kids by promoting something, you know, but, you know, expediency was, um, you know, at some level I said, well, we really want this program to go out of business because we don't want people to smoke. But body shaming and embarrassing people and bullying, which is what gets complicated here, is, uh, you know, promoting, um, you know, the words used today, we've all become tribal. We've retreated to our own, uh, I don't know, bubbles and echo chambers and whatever, but, but connecting as people and respecting you know, the struggles that people, you know, are going through and the challenges uh, that people have and helping people make healthy choices, you know, uh, um, in that process and not shaming people and bullying people. And plus the science we learned, as I alluded to earlier, you know, that a BMI over 25 was not necessarily always associated with an untoward set of circumstances. So it may be not your BMI that's the issue. It may be nutritional deficiencies in the diet that we want to promote. And we promote physical activity um, you know, as something that's healthy for mind and body. So again, a, you know, a great question, but it involves you know, balance. It involves an intelligent approach to certain things. And, you know, I'm reminded of, I, I'm embarrassed to say, I can't remember who wrote the song. Um, you know, that business of, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail and, you know, and, you know, taking more thoughtful approaches to certain things. On the other hand there, you know, there, you know, it's certainly the balance is, you know, cigarette smoking is not healthy. You know, we have multiple laws and yet it's still, we haven't abolished it. Um, but it's really, you know, most things is trying to strike that balance. And I guess the last thing I would say about balance, you know, for, you know, Sam's benefit, it's a dynamic balance, meaning it's always intention and you have to be mindful of, you know, maybe for now I'll eat a cookie, you know, and for over here, I'll enhance the, for Jason, the vegetables, uh, you know, uh, uh, a little bit more, but it's a dynamic balance. It's not static, meaning you just achieve it and it stays in balance sort of all the time. 
Thank good you. Que Matt. Good questions, tough questions. And great answers. Thank you for that. Um, I think we're getting ready to wrap up pretty soon, but I have one more question kind of backtracking. So before you're talking about how you could um, prescribe mothers to eat certain foods rather than just telling them to go get formula and that would kind of like in turn help out the farmers and such. So how are conclusions like that drawn where it's like kind of a multidisciplinary like involving economics and health and public health, like just all wrapped up in one? Is it like people from multiple um like disciplines come together to work on something like that and do research on that or is it more just kind of assumptions are made and then studies are done to back it up after well you know the glib answer is you all should take my class jason and sapir uh um you, you know we understand some gross and i don't mean gross in a negative sense but big large macro uh phenomena you know, um, and it's appreciating some of those large, you know, take the McDonald's thing, convenience and consistency. You know, how do you translate some of the things that we, you know, are comfortable with and that we sort of gravitate toward and make them more mm, productive in, in whatever, you know, you know, we're doing and, and, um, you know, and then this sounds trite, but, you know, the classic example is sort of the win-win set of circumstances and trying to figure out, you know, what, what indeed were the motivations for certain programs. And I have to be candid with not being cynical. You know, what problem were we trying to solve? We were trying to solve, you know, maintaining the farmer in a small farm, working damn hard and earning a living. And so, you know, we had a number of, of there's something called the Commodity Supplemental Feeding Program, where the government bought huge amounts of foods, repackaged them, you, you know, didn't have the marketing. It was the same cheese as name brand cheese, but, and we'd sell them. But a lot of those, the motivation was to help out struggling farmers. Um, and so a, a real insight into public policy is trying to, and frankly, it works at, at, at patient care as well. You know, uh, trying to understand where people are and trying not to, you know, to Sapir's, uh, um, you don't shame people, but you try to say, well, help me understand why you're hesitant to have a vaccine. You know, help me understand um, 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 what that's about and to try to balance those kinds of um, things. It, it just reminds me of a, of a last story that complements this. We were at a hearing for a congressman on, on promoting immunizations and the untoward concern about autism. You know, there's always been an association because of timing and it created some level of vaccine hesitancy uh, and still does and distorted, you know, talk about misinformation, false information. It's certainly been disproven. But the whole point of this mm, story is that the, that the chair of the department, the chair of the department, chair of the, of the congressional hearing, you know, was interrogating us like just, it was sort of relentless about vaccines. It turned out that we didn't do our homework. He was a grandfather of a child that had autism and his personal experience was that it was, even if he read the science, he wasn't sitting up there as a chair of a congressional committee was sitting up here as a grandfather trying to struggle with you know how did how did my grandchild come down with autism or be diagnosed with autism and you know I'm reacting more emotionally what I'm connecting is whether it's an emotional background or an economic background the message here is um try to figure out the, the most effective way to communicate um, 
the last thing I'm going to say is my wonderful experience working at, at Sesame Street uh, uh, taught me some lessons. You know, as a clinician, mostly we live in the don't. You know, don't drink, don't smoke. Mm, pediatricians mm, live more in the do side, a little more positive, a little more constructive. But at the workshop, I learned um, the easies are important. You know, can, that's where that convenience stuff comes to. But the last element that they would share was they made learning fun. So it went from the don'ts to the fun and balancing all of those elements. And, and look, yes, it's looking at some of the big picture and the competing forces and trying to, you know, you know, balance some of these things. And, you know, today we're hyper-polarized, we're tribal, you know, every message is, you know, a threat to somebody or other, and it's hard to understand, um, you know, back to the gun violence business about how just, you know, keeping lethal things, we, you know, we've all grown up with locking poisons, you know, under the sink or in a, you know, safe storage, we put, you know, caps on medications so kids couldn't, you know, open them. Um, you can't go to school unless you're immunized, you, you know, click it or ticket. I mean, we, we, you know, we've moved forward. So, you know, safe storage has got to be something we got to, you know, it's got to become commonplace. And then the other last part of this is most people are on board with that. Sometimes the politicians are um, the last to come aboard. But I think it's creating these win-win opportunities. I just want to know how you all are going to get into medical school with all this information, but I just want to say thank you so much for all the great information that you shared. It was definitely great to learn a lot and get to know more on public health policy and such from you. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. You gave some really great in, great insight, and I'm definitely going to be looking at your class for the spring. Well, well, absolutely. You know, same um, with me. Oh no. You know, you know, terrific. I mean, I, you know, I think you know what we do in this class is, you know, try to think about challenging basic things that we, you know, take to some degree for granted. But listen, thank you, you know, at least the three of you for doing this. I mean, I, you know, um, you know, sometimes we do these things in person and mm, Zoom is at least a decent substitute, not the best, you know, and again, um, just, you know, three cheers for, you know, what you're doing. And, you know, I looked at some of the other interviews and they were terrific and just getting, you know, some level of insight um, you know, moving your, your careers forward, you know, um, um, there's no wrong path. And, and interestingly enough, in, in, in this country, um, uh, most all medical schools have um, merit to them. And, and some of it's because people don't realize that it's, you know, they're all connected to a hospital and we, we regulate the hell out of care. You know, there's laboratory regulations and cleanliness and food. And so medical school, as opposed to other things, have this big influence. Uh, you know, it's not just, you know, those with the largest research endowment or whatever. They all have a, a commitment to improving the lives and well-being of, of one another. So, again, thank you for what you're doing. I mean, you know, we're just sort of the entertainment, you know, along the path, but, you know, the three of you and interviewing people and creating a library of characters that, you know, when you super bored at three o'clock in the morning, you can, you know, YouTube some of these things and see if there's anything worthwhile there. So thank you. Thank you. And I think that uh, you you definitely this episode has added a new perspective to our channel. So we appreciate it. Well, make sure you tell um, President Pines. I mean, I will share with, uh, you know, with Daryl what you're doing. Um, I mean, another we're fortunate enough to have such a good soul, but 
you know, I'd send him a special invitation. I, I don't know if he knows all the incredible creative energy of, you know, most of you, uh, all of you on campus and just, you know, these kinds of thoughtful, you know, efforts that you all are doing. Anyway, thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. And it's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed it. Have a great day. You Take too. Care. Bye.